Good afternoon, everyone. I am really glad to see you here for the lunchtime session of this important conference. I'm sure you all had a wonderfully stimulating morning. I had my own stimulating morning, as some of my students here can attest. We were discussing Miranda, but um, I'm sure you all had a lot more fun than we did. I'm here uh, to introduce to you Professor Lonnie Guineer, sitting right here, who is the Bennett Bosky Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Professor Guineer is actually a graduate of this university's law school. And after leaving Yale, Professor Guineer practiced as a civil rights attorney at the United States Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division and then at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. After several years in practice, Professor Guineer then headed to the University of Pennsylvania Law School, where she began deeply thoughtful and path-breaking scholarly work focused on issues of race, gender, inequality, and methods of structuring and restructuring democratic decision-making in order to address the distortive effects on citizenship that race, gender, and class inequality can have. Professor Guineer has published a host of books, including Becoming Gentlemen, Women, Law School, and Institutional Change with Michelle Fine and Jane Balin, The, Min the Miner's Canary, Enlisting Race, Resisting Power, Transforming Democracy with Gerald Torres, and published just last month, The Tyranny of the Meritocracy, Democratizing Higher Education in America. In addition to all this, Professor Guineer is a talented and inspirational teacher, having won, won many awards for her teaching. We here are proud and lucky to have had her teach at Yale Law School and hopeful she will come again. And I can say personally, Lonnie is a wonderful friend and mentor and an inspiration to those of us women, and everyone, but I'm speaking personally, women of color in law teaching. But now, it is time for us to learn again from Professor Guineer. So I have at least five different speeches that I could use to talk to you today. But I think um, it's most important, especially having experienced the first half of our convening, or the first, I should say, the morning of our convening, that what really strikes me about being back at Yale Law School is the importance of developing a learning environment in um, which participants can develop and build on relationships among diverse groups of people who come from different backgrounds in order to work together to solve problems. Now, why did I pick that particular topic? Because one of the things that makes me um, happy to come back to New Haven is that my son went here as an undergraduate. I went to the law school, and I've then also been invited to come back and teach at the law school. And one of the themes that I think is, is really tracked in those different experiences is the importance of being able to work together, not only with your peers, but with your students to solve problems. And the particular form of problem solving that I want to talk about because I think it's really important, especially in the context of this uh, forum, in which we're trying to talk about the Voting Rights Act and talk about um, democracy in a claimed to be democratic society. And in that process, how do we talk in a way that's not just about grieving or complaining, but is really about solving problems, that is about brainstorming collectively solutions, or at least as, as aspiration to solutions that may work better than what the status quo is providing. And so this collaborative problem solving idea is what I call confirmative met merit, in that it rejects the idea of individual competition 
in pursuit or based on individual merit. So when you think, for example, about people applying to Yale Law School or people applying to Yale College, the conversation tends to be very individualistic. It's about each person trying very hard to get the, um, the, the, the special prize. And what I'd like us to step back and think about is the importance of developing, identifying, and working with a diverse group of people who have very different perspectives but can work together to collaborate to solve really um, challenging problems. So I'm choosing this particular theme in part because I just wrote a book about it, The Tyranny of the Meritocracy. So I'm really interested in your feedback in terms of the thesis of that book because it just was published and so I don't know if it's a good book or a bad book. I'm really interested in, in, in your feedback. So some of the things that inspired me to focus on this problem of collaborative problem solving, and I shouldn't say this problem of collaborative problem solving, but this opportunity to consider collaborative problem solving as a means of not only um, changing the world, but of educating a population. So I was inspired in part by a professor of um, calculus, which may seem very strange since I know very little about math. But his name is Uri Treisman. At the time that um, I'm going to reference, he was a, um, a, a graduate student at Berkeley. He's now a professor at um, UT, University of Texas, Austin. And he was concerned because he was teaching calculus and the black students in his class were not doing as well as some of the other students. And he wanted to, to know what the problem was and he talked to his colleagues about why you know, the black students weren't doing very well and his colleagues came back with, I guess you'd have to call it predictable responses in the United States, which is there must be something wrong with those black people. They're probably not working very hard, they're not doing their um, homework, it's you know, all their fault. Well, to Uri Treisman's um, better half, he said, well, let me see what they're doing. And he hired people to actually videotape what the black students were doing when they were studying calculus. And then he also noticed that the Chinese American students were doing really well in calculus, so he had somebody tape, uh, videotape them. And he discovered that the black um, students were studying calculus, but they were doing it alone. They were sitting in their um, dorm rooms with the calculus book open and trying to work through the problems. The Chinese American students were talking calculus with each other when they were walking to class, when they were eating lunch, when they were eating dinner, and it was that um, ability to work in a group and to get other people to um, help you understand points of um, challenge that struck Treisman's um, attention, and he then arranged a, a, an opportunity for the black students to meet in a separate, uh, quote unquote, posse, or in a separate group, and talk about various um, calculus problems together. And through that process, the black students' scores in calculus started to go up. Now, he also served food, that's important. <laughs> But the food was not because the black students were um, too thin or uh, needed to gain weight. It was because people were more relaxed in talking to each other while they were um, eating, and they didn't feel as if there was a competitive um, sort of architecture where they were competing against each other, they were working together to solve these problems. Now, Uri Treisman is not the only professor that I've um, talked to about changing the way in which we think about merit, to think about it as something that is the outcome of collaborative and um, engaged interaction, as opposed to uh, merit being measured by how well you do on the SAT, the LSAT, the GRE, or whatever other test you took to get here. And I have to say, especially with regard to the um, LSAT, 
when I was at the University of Pennsylvania Law School for reasons that I'm not yet um, clear on, the dean gave me access to four years of grades at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Now that's unusual, but he also gave me their, the people's LSAT scores, their undergraduate GPA. All of this um, I was doing 20 odd years ago, but that was about women, not about um, issues of, uh, of race. But it has um, some overlap, because part of what I found looking at the data on um, women and men at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, the women and the men had very similar LSAT scores, very similar undergraduate GPAs, but once they got to law school, the men were more likely to rise to the top of the class and the women to the bottom of the class. And nobody seemed to care, right? Nobody seemed to think there must be something wrong with the tests we're using or the atmosphere that we're creating that women who had very similar LSAT scores, very similar undergraduate GPAs, were not doing as well once they got to law school. Now, what, um, what Eric Mazur did in, in trying to figure out what's going on, he's the, the, the uh, professor of physics, he was also worried because in his physics class, the women were not doing as well as the men. And so he decided that he was going to um, give the students an opportunity to talk to each other um, on particular issues that, that some students found difficult. And so he gave everybody clickers, and he gave them questions, and you had to um, click the answer and then talk to your peers who were sitting next to you or sitting in front of you about the answer you chose. And then after talking to your peers, you get a second chance of, of um, zapping, the, uh, <coughs> uh, zapping what the right answer is. And it, he found that that also worked very well to improve the women's performance in physics. That is, once they had a physics test, they really understood the concepts that were being considered. They really understood the um, challenges that they were facing. And this idea of, Collaborating to solve problems is something that he continues to use as a, a pedagogical method. Now, it's not just something that people use in um, law school or in physics. Scott Page, who's a professor of complex problems at um, the University of Michigan, he has um, he, he's done a number of studies where he finds that when you have a group of people trying to figure out what the answer is to a particular problem, there's often a situation in which some people, and everybody is given two, that you can give two answers. And he said, you want to have people who are going to give answers that are unpredictable. And you want to have people who are looking at the problem from a very different perspective, because it's through that collaborative um, interaction that you really get to the heart of the problem. That many people who are looking at the problem see a problem, but they don't necessarily understand the depth of the problem. They don't necessarily understand what the problem is connected to. But when you bring people with very different perspectives into the um, situation, then you, it opens up different people's eyes. For example, in Scott Page's um, studies, he said that when you're giving somebody a test and somebody gets um, seven questions right, but they get three questions wrong, and you might want to put them with somebody who got um, six questions right, and of the six questions, three of the, the ones that the other person got wrong, this person got right. And you want to put people together who have um, different perspectives, different strengths, and through that process, you get to address a much greater sense of, of what the problem is. Now, why am I talking to you about um, higher education and why am I talking about different ways of um, solving problems? I think it's really important, especially in the context of this particular conference, that we start thinking about different ways of solving the problem. We just had a, a, a conference discussion this morning about the Voting Rights Act. And 
the way in which this um, particular Supreme Court has decided that the Voting Rights Act may still remain on the, uh, as part of legislature that is simply um, not legislature that anybody can do anything with. It's just sitting there. Now, it means we have to learn how to collaborate with people who disagree with us. We have to learn that it's not just about competitive individualism. It's not just about um, trying to show that you're smarter than everyone else. It's really a, um, an important uh, opportunity for looking at op uh, of, of ways of collaborating with not, not your opponent, per se, but with other people who are looking at the problem slightly differently than you are, but that different perspective is really important, really helpful if you um, connect to it. So going back to Scott Page, he says, if you have um, people taking a test and one person got you know, seven of the 10 questions right and somebody else got um, seven of the questions wrong, but the, the three questions they got right were the three questions that the first person had gotten wrong, you still might wanna have that that group work together because they're, they're coming from different perspectives and as a result, you've covered the uh, um, area even though the people that you've uh, brought together are not e equal, they're not equivalent in the sense that one person obviously did better on the um, exam but missed issues that somebody else could um, help them understand. So, I don't want to um, bore you with, with other examples of collaborative problem solving, but, but I do want to suggest that there are, in terms of diversity, there are really important issues both of gender and of race in thinking about uh, problem solving. For example, um, Anita Woolley, who's a professor at um, Carnegie Mellon, did a study where, and she did a study with um, another professor in which she had people wearing these big glasses to see um, uh, where their eyes were when they were trying to solve a problem. And, and what she discovered is that the more women you had in the group, the better the group was at solving problems. Why? Because the women actually listened to what everyone else was saying. The men, on the other hand, right, they, they were dominating the conversation. That's not to say that they didn't have something to, um, to, uh, to, to address or to, or to um, provide. It's that they thought they were the answer to the, to the conversation. They were the leader of the conversation. They were the solver of, of, of the problems. And um, what Anita Woolley uh, says in, in describing her findings, the more women you had in a group, the better the group was at solving problems, up to 85%. Once you had 85% women, you could then have some men. <laughs> now that's an interesting, um, that's, that's, to me, that's a really interesting um, idea in, in that I, I feel it's time for us, and um, we were talking a little bit about what's happened with the Congress. It's time for us to get more women into positions of, um, of power, more, more uh, people of color elected to positions of power, but it doesn't mean that they necessarily have to get elected or necessarily have to assume positions of power by pursuing conventional means. In other words, by running for office and then trying to um, get a position as a member of Congress or as a member of your legislature. And then once you're in the legislature or in Congress, then you start to think you're really powerful. And then you start to think about um, ways in which you can remain powerful. And the, the relationship between those who represent and those who are being represented is, is, is not um, equal. So, my, the, the point I'm trying to make, basically, is that we have to learn how to be collaborative in solving problems rather than dominative or dom dominational. We have to learn how to listen to other people with whom we disagree, not because we will then agree with them, but to hear if there are things that they say that 
are at least close enough to, to where we want to go that we can work together in that, um, or at least starting in, 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 in that context. But the key point that I'm trying to make is the power of collaborative problem solving and the importance of us learning how to work with other people, especially other people who have very different backgrounds, very different um, strengths, if we want to really um, interrogate and, and really lead, and I don't mean lead in terms of being at the front of the march, I mean influence the way in which we think about um, merit, the way in which we think about politics, the way in which we think about leadership. And so I want to end with um, a story that Nelson Mandela tells about this concept of um, leadership. He says that um, he was influenced by shepherds in um, South Africa when he, when he was growing up because if you were a shepherd and it was time to corral the flock to go home at night, you don't just um, stand in front of the flock and say, hey, come on, let's go. You stand behind the flock, you identify one or two of the young sh uh, sheep who are moving in the right direction, and then you corral the rest of the flock to follow those young sheep. And so in some ways, I see you as the young sheep, right? And the, the, the challenge is for you guys to be moving in the right direction, but to do so with energy and with um, a sense of commitment to collaborative problem solving. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, you so at this point, we're going to have uh, questions of Professor Guarnier. You can see there are two microphones, and we'd ask that you cue behind the microphones. And, okay, um, I, see, so one of the things, just, I'm happy to do that. I just want to use this as an opportunity to tell you the way I would do it if we had more time. That's, if we had more time. Please, you know, I was given my instructions by the <laughs> no, person who's in charge. No, 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 I'm not, I, I just wanna, th <laughs> this is an opportunity. <laughs> how, would sh how should we do it? What's that? How should we do it, do you think? I can't hear you. How do you, how would you like to do this? Oh, the, well the way I would like to do it is for people to talk to the other people at their table so that they have a sense of um, whether what they're saying makes sense or whether what they're saying is something that's um, so far amiss they shouldn't say it. <laughs> oh, you mean before they ask a question? Yes. Oh, I, okay. I don't mean they should, I'm not saying they should get permission right. from their um, group. That, I'm saying they should try out their idea. That's a idea. really good idea, but I'm already but we don't standing have here, so can I ask my question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, even after collaborating, um, those who know me well, including I, no, we my don't partner who's sitting at this table would know that I really wouldn't care and I would just ask any. Yeah. Okay. okay. So here, here's, here's my question, uh, just, to, just to start us off. I love this idea uh, about collaborative decision making. Um, it's interesting though that the examples that you use are, you know, about math and, and physics, you know, places where there wouldn't necessarily be, I say necessarily, because this isn't obviously true, um, uh, ideology. Um, but you've already referenced it in, in your remarks about you know, a Congress that's having difficulty getting, thing done, getting things done, in part because there's so much polarization. So I wonder if you want to say something about how to think about, um, if at all, maybe you would say there are limits, right? That's limit case how to think about this kind of collaborative decision making in a context of extreme, po extremely polarized I ideology um, and, you know, especially with reference to uh, the, the issues that you care about so deeply. Well, because I know something about the substance of what you're saying, I, I would probably be interested in people who are looking forward rather than people who are looking backwards. So for me, it's not about replacing or um, reinstating or saving the Voting Rights Act as it has been. It's really about using this as an opportunity to move forward in a new direction. And to think about, at least from my perspective, if I were in charge, I would ask people to go around and interview people from around the world and ask the people in South Africa, particularly ask the people in Germany, how they run their elections. The reason I say Germany is because 
They run their elections because the United States of America insisted they do it the way they do it, and they do it in a way that um, allows them two votes. They get to vote once for the person who's going to represent them um, geographically, you know, lives in the community, knows the problems of the community, and one that's ideological, that, um, re that represents your views, and that's something the United States imposed on Germany after World War II. Now, if the United States thought it was a good idea after World War II, it seems to me we could um, go back and draw on that since it seems to have worked, right? So, so I, I, I do think that, um, it's, it, that it's an opportunity to investigate what else is happening around the world. It would be nice to look at Australia where you have to vote and, 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 and think about what's happening contemporaneously rather than what the forefathers thought in um, the 1700s when they um, all, oh, I shouldn't say all, when a lot of them had slaves, right? I don't know why we've um, validated them for you know, the last 300 years. I mean, obviously they did some good things, but they also did some very bad things. <laughs> yeah, if we had more time, it, it, you guys could talk to your neighbors and it would, but we don't have the time. So can I, so I'm going to. So you the represent question. the. Uh, um, and I'm going to assume that my table is on board with me. <laughs> um, we, yeah, that's, we you, you must be an American. Over, over lunch, so they, they can feel where I'm coming from. So I like this model, and I think it, uh, it strikes at the core of a norm that has the backing of hundreds of years of, you know, that is very, the very core of our liberal individualistic democracy. And yet, I'm trying to think about how this plays out when we have such entrenched segregation across space that many of us no longer live in the cross-class neighborhoods of yesteryear. Many of us Literally, as I mentioned this morning, 70% of us would have to move to a different place to have that kind of uh, connection with different people of different perspectives and life experiences. And so collaboration might take place, but it's going to take place within the context that we're in, which is highly segregated, highly siloed neighborhood spaces, educational spaces, uh, political spaces. When you look at maps of the United States, the number of counties from 1970 to today, the number of counties that are, that are now politically homogenous has increased rapidly. So I guess I'm, I, I'd like a little bit more specifics about how you see this. Do, can this take place until, unless we've addressed those prior siloed, heavily segregated contexts that many of us find ourselves in? No, so I think it's a fair question. I think it's a, an important question. And I haven't really addressed or, or thought through this issue in the context of elections. I've thought through it much more in the context of higher education. Mm -hmm. And so I think if we, think if we consider higher education as an um, experiment, then and, and it works, mm -hmm. assuming it does, then I would move into the um, right. political domain. But so when I say in the um, educational context, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the Posse Foundation as an example. Posse Foundation is an organization that brings together groups of people who uh, come from um, working class or um, otherwise challenged backgrounds, and they are um, admitted or selected to work as a group of eight to, t to ten people and are then eligible for being admitted to a, a college based on their posse. So not one person gets elected, but the posse gets um, selected. Mm -hmm. Now, what does, wh what's the significance of that? Especially for um, people who are coming from working class families where they, or from families where no one in their um, family or certainly not their parents have gone to college um, who, who are uh, in, in many ways not working beyond perhaps working in an automobile factory or, or, or something like that. 
And the Posse program identifies people who can work together to, con to contribute something to the project and can reinforce each other and remind each other that even when you are going backwards, you still have us to help you go forwards. And I think the Posse program is a really good example of um, th this, this notion of collaboration. Uh, obviously, it's, in, in Posse, I'm not, I'm not suggesting they do this, and they don't, that people go to college and they all have to um, you know, do their homework together, or they have to prepare for the same courses. They don't necessarily have to take the same courses. It's the opportunity to be in an environment in which other people understand your challenges and are um, prepared to give you the opportunity of complaining and then reinforcing you. It's, it's like if you were you know, playing football or you were playing um, uh, basketball and you're working on a team, that the team, everybody on the team doesn't do everything the same, but the team as a team wants people to do well. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the mm -hmm. same idea in Posse, that they want p people to do well, but not necessarily do exactly what they're doing either. Thank you. Others? Hi, thank you for the talk. How do you collaborate with people who question your very legitimacy in an institution? I mean, this has like obvious ramifications with politics and some of the voting rights acts that we've been talking about, but in particular, higher education. I'm sorry, is there a light on me? You, you're... The, the light on you is so bright that... Um... Yeah, cocoa <laughs> butter. It's not true. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm like shine like Jermaine Jackson. No, 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 it's messed up. I'm real sorry. No, it's like okay, okay. so I'm California raisin right now. Um, the the question I guess I have for you is in, in particular. I'm taking the LSAT tomorrow, oh, and I've been wow. reading a lot about mismatch theory. Um, Professor um, Rick Sander, I believe, the general idea. See, you you're familiar. Um, yes, I am. The general idea for those who are unfamiliar is that African Americans display lower uh, undergraduate GPAs and lower LSAT scores than their white and Asian counterparts. And so a new way of looking at affirmative action would be to shunt those students into second, third, fourth tier law schools where they are more likely to succeed and therefore become lawyers. That's his theory. I found it a little repugnant when I was reading about it, when I learned about it in Intelligence Square debates. And I'd like to hear your view on it because people like that make assumptions about black intelligence based on their own you know, assumptions about where African Americans have been allowed to do well or been able to uh, effectively you know, push themselves through the ranks. And they assume that things like affirmative action should no longer exist in the way they you know, currently are. I mean, if there are people who agree with this on the Supreme Court. When people are saying they don't want you in the institution, that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, and no matter what you do, you'll never quite be as good as other members of the uh, electorate, how do you collaborate with them in the way you describe? <laughs> you don't collaborate with them if you're talking about um, the people I think you're talking about. Um, it, it's a really good question, and since you are taking the exam tomorrow, I want to reassure you of a number of things. The LSAT is a terrible predictor of performance in law school. Terrible. It predicts 14% of the variance in first year classes, 15% of the variance second year, meaning second year 85% of the um, of the LSAT um, score takers, it's not predicting, right? So it creates a kind of um, artificial intensity for people who, you know, like you who have the exam tomorrow and you're really worried about how well you're going to do and then that worrying interferes emotionally with your ability to do well. And I just want to give you an example of um, a student of mine who is brilliant. This, actually he wasn't a student of mine, he, was a, he, he did research for me. He was an undergraduate. And he, he had a, um, a memory that was so um, complete, he could tell me what page the information that I was looking for was on, not only what page, what line on the page 
it was looking for. And yet, and, and he took the um, LSAT, uh, the, the LSAT um, test, pretest um, exams, and he did it 30 times, and he still didn't do well on the LSAT. The guy is brilliant. He did not do well on the LSAT. And I had to, um, I mean, he, he since then, in part because I reassured him that that was no reflection on him, he, he's, he's gotten a Rhodes Scholar. I mean, he, he's gotten all kinds of um, recognition. And in fact, he's going to be going to Harvard Law School in a year. So what, what is that about? Well, it's, he, I think he's you know, really nervous when he's taking these tests, and that nervousness deflates his um, capacity to think in, in a way that um, he normally thinks. So it's, it's create, it creates this extremely harsh environment. And the reason that all of this bothers me so much is that when you look at people's LSAT scores and you look at their law school grades, the LSAT is a weak predictor of those grades. That's what I was saying earlier. Predicts 14% of the variance in first year grades, meaning 86% of the time it's wrong. So we're using this test that, that is not going to um, predict you, your, your future in substance, but it may predict your future in terms of the way in which um, some organizations call them law schools. Uh, are, are still, for whatever reason, uh, indebted to or invested in uh, the LSAT as, as, as a symbol. So tomorrow, just go there feeling very powerful. Thank you. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> a little late on the gray hair, though. Don't worry. <laughs> Hello, Professor. Thank you for your talk. Uh, in the context of higher education, as uh, as we move, or if we move, towards more, uh, a more collaborative approach towards problem solving and thinking about classes and that sort of stuff, um, does that affect how we assess or how we should assess individuals coming out of school? So if we talk about grades, a grade is, or like a GPA is, my individual number. But if it's not tied to my individual performance, is there a better way to measure group performance or to account for that somehow? Okay, I'm not sure I'm following the <laughs> distinction that you're trying to make. I actually allow students to take an exam in my law and political process class with other students. And um, I, I grade the exam the way I would grade anyone's exam because I don't know who wrote what part of it. But I'm encouraging the students to talk to each other, and I'm assuming the, the students at Harvard are not stupid, that they're going to make sure everybody knows what they're doing. They're not just going to say to somebody, go answer question two, and we'll rely on you and not check out what you've done. So my effort is to get the students to talk to each other, or, or my goal, and to help those who are confused to to work it so that um, it starts to make sense, so that the students become very good teachers of each other, not just um, students of me. And I found that to be, I mean, students can also just take the, um, the test individually. I'm not insisting anybody work this way. But um, my, my, fi my findings are that the students who worked in groups do much better on the exam than most of the students who work by themselves. Now, there are some students who are just so brilliant that they don't need any help, but they're rare. So, so you don't have to change yourself, in other words, in, in order to um, succeed, but you do have to challenge what, you know, you have to challenge some of the conventional wisdom and, and feel confident about your own. That, that actually kind of got it. I, uh, I didn't realize it, but that was exactly the answer that I was looking for. Oh. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, this person is leaving. Oh, um, hello. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm going to um, push you a little bit more 
um, to talk about um, collaboration when, I mean, you talk about collaborative problem solving, mm -hmm. right? And um, I want us to think about, a little bit about what does it mean if the problem can't be solved, right? So with math and maybe law exams, there is an answer, there is a right answer, right? Um, how do we think about issues like inequality and racism, right? Um, when, you know, we live in a world where some people think it's intractable, right? How do we solve these problems that are unsolvable? So what else is to be gained from collaborative work um, that isn't coming up with like a solution? Um, what else is to be gained? Because I think for some people that's the challenge, right? It's like we, we're not going to solve the problem of inequality in my critical race theory class, right? But we're doing some kind of collaborative, collaborative work that's getting us to something, right? It's a process. So I'm wondering if you could talk more about that process and the benefits when there's no, I don't want to say solution, but um, when we, we may not find a solution, right? Um, but there is something that seems to be gained from doing that kind of collaborative work. So I think that's a great question, and I, I think that the fact of working with other people, and even if you don't come to, quote, the right answer or the, the, the best answer, that act of working with other people itself challenges you to think outside of your own box. And it's, it's learning how to listen to other people's comments to try to incorporate what they're saying and to to realize that you know you may have looked at things with a relatively narrow perspective and you forgot what was happening on the far right or the far left and as a result it just infuses what you're doing with I think more information they do um, something in Sweden that has been um, imitated in the United States uh, in Sweden as you know it's very cold in the um, winter although I can tell you in Boston it's really cold <laughs> Boston is not Sweden yet, but it's moving in that direction. Or I should say Cambridge. So in, in Sweden, it, when it's really cold, they have people uh, um, read something like, they, they, have, they, they create little groups, it's like a posse, but it, they're not going to college, they're living in their, um, in their various homes. And they get together in the evening in, in someone's home talking about what they've all read. And people have very different views, but that process gets them to at least willing to listen to what somebody else is saying. And hearing what somebody else is saying for the first time, hearing meaning really incorporating what they're hearing. I'm not saying they're hard of hearing. And that, that process creates a, a kind of um, interaction and then this group starts to think not just, well, this is the book I read or this is the, the um, article I read, but this is a problem that I've been um, trying to address in the way in which the cars are going in front of my house or you know, some concrete problem. And because they've, they've started to see each other as having different strengths and, and, and different um, experiences, they start to listen to each other and, and they become um, capable of thinking together as a group, and I don't mean that they all agree with each other, but they focus on a particular problem and they represent different aspects of it and then they get organized and they go to uh, mass meetings. And I would say, look at uh, Taylor Branch's book on um, parting the waters, and the, in particular the Montgomery bus boycott, where you had black people who had very little power, feeling empowered by going to church for a mass meeting. And the mass meeting was not there to determine who's the smartest person in this room and we're gonna send that smartest person out to go negotiate with the um, bus company, right? That this, this was a way of giving people a sense of, um, of identity but also of connection. And feeling really powerful that, that they were part of a larger group, not just having to 
to, to make all of these decisions individually and independently. One quick announcement before um, we all head out um, is we're going back to 77 Prospect in, uh, in the downstairs for two more panels, uh, one on capital formation within minority communities uh, and one on punishment and surveillance and deportation. Um, and so please join us and join us for the reception afterwards. Um, and thank you so much, Lonnie. Oh, well thank you.